Great, thanks, Bob. I really appreciate that. Um, Yep, as Bob said, my name is Patrick Schultz. Um, I work for WC Extension. I help coordinate this with Nick Coons. Uh, I just wanted to, to briefly introduce our first speaker, uh, Mark Swanson. Mark is an associate professor uh, with the WC School of Environment. He's also been tasked with leading the charge on uh, rebuilding the undergrad uh, forestry program at WC, which is really exciting. Um, so his research encompasses a pretty wide array of topics, including the structure and function of early succession forests in the Pacific Northwest, uh, ecology of native large animals, and forest, dis forest disturbance processes. Um, but today we'll be discussing that first topic, which is the importance of early successional forests and management implications for forest owners uh, that want to create and protect them. So with that, uh, Mark, you can take it away. Nick, you'll need to probably stop sharing your screen. All right, well, thank you, Patrick. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, should just take a second here. Okay, can everybody see a PowerPoint there? Yep, looks good. Fantastic, well, wonderful. Well, thank you for that introduction, Patrick. And, you know, I'm, I'm really honored to be in a session here with strong practitioners like Bob Obudzinski and uh, incredibly esteemed scientists like Connie Harrington. You know, these, these people have really set the pace for uh, private forestry and public forestry in the Northwest for decades. And it's really an honor to be here with them. And, you know, uh, since I'm talking to primarily a group of West Side non-industrial private forest landowners, I, I want to also mention that a, a lot of what I learned during my undergraduate years, and my graduate years over at the University of Washington was from a fellow named Steve Stinson, who uh, came from a tree farming family in the Toledo, Washington area. And Steve really taught me a lot about uh, the philosophy of, of private forest management and really gave us a very strong legacy uh, for that. So anyway, I just wanted to give a shout out to Steve, who unfortunately has passed away, but he really represented the spirit of non-industrial private forest landowners in Washington state. So I understand that the theme of uh, your series of talks is stand dynamics, correct? Yes, definitely. Okay, well, good. Well, dynamics would suggest that you have change over time. And in the forest, time since disturbance is a very important aspect of time. It's not absolute time, but it's developmental time. What's going on in the forest environment as a response to the changes that were wrought by the disturbance that began succession over. Now, following a major disturbance, you often have this period where trees are not going to be the major life form. It's a time where shrubs, where grasses, forbs can dominate the site. Now, trees are present, uh, or they may be very slow in returning to the site. What that means is that trees are not necessarily dominant on the forest site for a while. And this ushers in a period of incredible biological and ecological richness. You have herbs and shrubs that are dominant, and this benefits the trophic cascade upwards. Deer, elk, mountain sheep, other herbivores are able to avail themselves of those resources. They flower and fruit uh, profusely, and this brings in pollinators and a number of other organisms. Black bears, for example, will come in to feed on shrubs that are producing berries at an extremely high rate because these shrubs have all the light that they need and other resources to flower and fruit at a good rate. You've got rapid nutrient cycling, and this includes fixation. Alders, members of the pea family, the legumes, if you will, uh, members of the buckbrush family, the rhamnaceae, these all can come in if trees are temporarily cleared from the forest site. And part of their ecological role is to pull nitrogen from the atmosphere and make it into a plant available form. And that goes on to become a benefit to other plants that are not able to fix nitrogen. There's an abundance of woody debris and snags following most types of disturbance. And this is because the previous disturbance killed trees. It knocked them down or killed them standing. And so we have an abundance of what ecologists call woody debris, which are large, usually large diameter, dead woody structures. And those benefit quite a number of organisms that use them for nesting cavities, that use them for feeding. They'll feed on the insects that are inside the wood, especially wood eating uh, larvae of certain families of beetle. You've also got a time of high temperature and wind, wind speed extremes. So the site becomes a little more extreme. Um, and again, 
high mammal, bird, and insect diversity. This is a time where a number of different functional groups of organism reached their greatest abundance and reached their greatest diversity because of these open site ecological characteristics. So let's just review succession. Succession is a sequence of compositional and structural changes that occur from the time of disturbance until you reach an old growth or complex phase of development. And so a lot of ecologists break succession down into distinct recognizable stages. Now, of course, in nature, these stages can uh, be brief. They can, they can bleed one stage into the next. The, they can be a little hard to distinguish at times. But uh, as a matter of understanding succession, we often find it useful to break it down into stages. So we begin with the disturbance itself, wind, fire, volcanic eruption, avalanche up in montane topography. And that leads us to the early serial or pre-forest stage when arguably we're not really in a forest condition, but we're in a condition, as I explained, that is dominated by other life forms besides trees. Now, once trees establish over the majority of the forest site, uh, we enter a young stand condition. And some scientists have referred to this as the stem exclusion stage, which means that new stems are excluded from establishing because the light environment is dominated by the young trees that have managed to establish there. And now we begin a period of competition where those trees are competing as they all grow larger and they compete for diminishing resources among themselves. Now, at some point, the forest starts to open up again as gap forming uh, small disturbances like bark beetles, root rot pockets, uh, microburst windstorms, things like that start to punch holes into that once smooth young forest canopy. So we begin to develop some structural complexity that is characteristic of later succession. And finally, we move more into an old growth or complex phase uh, where you have a lot of shade tolerant trees, trees that can tolerate the high shade forest understory environment, regenerating at a high rate and replacing themselves on the site. Now you may still have some large old early cereal species like Douglas fir, Western white pine that are there, but they're becoming progressively fewer in the stand. Now, production forestry tends to emphasize the disturbance uh, early cereal stage, which is pretty brief, and then they move it to the young stand stage, and then they harvest at some, uh, at some determined rotation. 40, 50 years of age is pretty frequent. So production forestry tends to maximize those stages in terms of frequency. Environmental advocacy in the Northwest is really focused on those older stages. Now, ecological silviculture, on the other hand, and a lot of silviculture that I've seen practiced on non-industrial private forest land ownings is really very ecological in nature. Um, that, that emphasized the entire seer. Ecological silviculture recognizes value in each of these stages. Now, this is how I present stand dynamics to my students. Um, and I show them this process chart. I show that in the stand initiation or early serial pre-forest stage, tree establishment is common. We have high uh, food web complexity. That's what I mean by trophic. We've got nitrogen fixation. We've got a lot of woody debris from the originating disturbance. And herbs and shrubs are diverse. That's what the HNS is down there. Now, as we move into that stem exclusion phase, we've got a lot of competition, but the young trees are growing very rapidly. And that's why foresters like to maximize that stage if they're uh, out for production values, you know, because wood is accumulating at the highest rate uh, throughout the entire sear. And also we're in a condition of crown closure, meaning that crowns have closed, they've met with each other and they're blocking most of the light to the forest understory. But then as we move into these later stages, we start to get more ecological process richness again, where disease and insects start to pick up. Nitrogen fixation increases. You start to get vertical continuity, meaning you've got tree foliage from the ground all the way up to the tops of the crowns you have a very complex canopy surface in those old forests. Woody debris has picked up again as trees that have died from competition and insects and disease begin to accumulate, and that leads to special habitat values. And it is a period again where herbs and shrubs uh, have prominence in the forest understory and gaps in the, in the uh, old growth forest. And, but it's a different set of shrubs typically and herbs than we see in early succession. These tend to be the more shade tolerant herbs and shrubs that prevail in the old growth stand. 
So why is early succession such a variable stage? It can present in so many different ways, uh, depending upon the disturbance type, depending upon what the forest looked like before it was disturbed, uh, depending upon the extent of the disturbance. How large was that disturbance? Was it a 40-acre clear cut or was it 50 square kilometers, as in the case of Mount St. Helens 1980. So there are a lot of variables that govern how disturbance presents itself and the types of early serial condition that it creates. Here's a good example. So there's a timber harvest mosaic in Western Washington state. Uh, I think that's from the um, Lewis River drainage. And you, we contrast that maybe with something like you see on the west slope of the Sierra Nevada where fire plays around the landscape, a little intense here, maybe lower uh, intensity and severity over there. Maybe that wet meadow and the trees around it are spared. So there's some spatial complexity there that we don't see at fine scales over in the timber harvest mosaic. And we see variable amounts of things like woody debris and non-tree vegetation. So there's a lot of variability in terms of how early succession can present itself. And it's not that one type of early succession is good and the other bad. It's just that they maximize different values. The landscape on the right maxim might maximize uh, deer and elk for it. Well, deer foraging in the Sierras over time. Over on the left, that timber harvest mosaic probably is going to maximize wood production over time with some temporary benefit for open habitat animals like butterflies, deer, and so forth. So there's a lot of variability here in the landscapes that are created by different kinds of disturbance. Now, early succession uh, can be governed by how heterogeneous that disturbance event is. You know, does it have variability in the disturbance event itself by how large it is, as I mentioned, and there's Mount St. Helens, 1980. And then very importantly, by the biological legacies that are left by that disturbance. And by biological legacies, I mean anything living or dead that carries over from the pre-disturbance stand to the post-disturbance stand. And different disturbances generate different biological legacies. Now, all three of those things are associated with the disturbance event itself. But then we have processes that tend to operate after the disturbance. So recolonization by trees, shrubs, other vegetation, that's a post-disturbance process. And then any microscale disturbances that occur early in succession. For example, if you have snags out there in your disturbed area and they start to fall in the decades following disturbance, they're going to crush or kill various parts of the regenerating forest. And so that's a continuation, if you will, of that first disturbance. So we also get complexity that is foisted on the system by post-disturbance process. So here's what high and mixed severity fire will give you. This is the margins of the biscuit fire. Uh, that occurred back in the early 2000s. So living trees, dead trees, we have downwoody debris. We have a diversity of conifers and broadleaf trees that are coming back. So this really represents a lot of ecological complexity in this system as created by a wildfire. Here's an avalanche track in the Spring Mountains, Nevada. Now this disturbance operated to the advantage of quaking aspen because aspen can just come back from root systems below ground, whereas the conifers have to come back in from seed. What this does though, having a, a long feature of aspen forest creates a cross slope fire break. And also the local deer herd and other organisms that like broadleaf vegetation really appreciate this kind of disturbance. And avalanche tracks can be incredibly diverse. For example, if you go hiking in the Cascades and you look under the slide alder overstory, that's a tall shrub that likes avalanche tracks, you can have tremendously high diversity of forbs and shrubs that are fruiting and flowering. So this makes them, uh, among other things, a very valued habitat for black bear foraging. Volcanic eruption is actually not that uncommon a disturbance in the Cascades, and it tends to leave pretty structurally complex post-eruptive environments. So this is Mount St. Helens in the wake of the 1980 disturbance. Now, ecologists expected a moonscape. That's not what they got. They instead got a landscape that was rich in organic legacies, these large dead trees, standing snags, and many plants that survived. In fact, there were very few vascular plants that were eliminated from the blast zone. And actually, it was noble fir and Douglas fir were largely eliminated from the blast zone. Almost every other vascular plant species persisted in Mount St. Helens. And all that vascular richness was joined by disturbance-dependent flora that came in from the outside. 
So as a consequence, we've seen some of the highest rates of diversity in the plant community in places like Mount St. Helens, where you get a mixture of the old forest vegetation and then new forest vegetation. And of course, snags and downwoody debris are characteristic of a lot of disturbances. Uh, of course, when we harvest timber, we do tend to take a lot of the woody material, but we can choose to retain some of this material in mimicry of what nature does, either through fire or through a process like windstorm. Now, when you take the trees from a site, you tend to get pretty high plant diversity um, because a lot of the disturbance adapted flora, all, all the plants that can float in on the wind, like fireweed, for example, will come in. You also have plants that are uh, dispersed by uh, vertebrates. You know, you black bear, for example, will consume huckleberries and pass the seeds on. A lot of birds will do the same thing for a lot of our fruiting shrubs um, or our herbs that have seeds. And so animals can play an important role in contributing to this high plant diversity. And this plant diversity has a lot of ecological consequences. For example, nutrient cycling. Does anybody know the forb that's in the foreground here? Here are some of my students. This is Yosemite National Park. What's that tall forb there? Anybody recognize it? Well, it's lupin. Lupin's a member of the pea family, and a lot of members of the pea family have symbiotic cyanobacteria in their roots that fix atmospheric nitrogen into a plant available form. And so what we're seeing is a great big pulse of a very important nutrient into this disturbed system. So nutrient cycling is an important part of early succession. Shrubs as well have a lot of ecological value. And this is from the Laguna Mountains of California here. You can see all the snags and woody debris, but also this is a time where shrubs can become prevalent on the site. And they can also have enough light to fruit and flower at a high rate. And that benefits a lot of other organisms. And shrubs can even play a facilitative role for tree regeneration. And I, I believe uh, Connie has done some research on that, the relationship of, of regenerating conifers to shrubs. And that's up here in the Northwest. So we often think of shrubs as competing with our little trees, but sometimes they may actually help them out. And of course, flower and fruit resources. A lot of plants that can hang on in the closed forest, they might be shade tolerant enough to hang on just in a vegetative state, just growing in terms of shoots and leaves, but they might not have enough energy to put out fruits and flowers. So one value of the early cereal environment is that these plants, whether shrubs or forbs, have enough energy because of the open sunlit environment to produce these important structures. So that's why pollinators and animals that consume fruits or animals that need nectar and pollen uh, to complete their life cycle uh, become much more abundant in the early cereal stage of development. So highlight levels give you a lot of photosynthate. You have a higher proportion of plants with fruits and seeds and the insects, the birds and the mammals benefit, but also humans as well. If you go up near Mount Adams, you'll uh, often go through the sawtooth berry fields. Uh, and this was a culturally important area for, um, for the Yakima Nation, some of the river tribes and some of the tribes from the west side. They would all converge in the late summer on the, um, the Indian Heaven era, er, area or the sawtooth berry fields, and they would pick black huckleberry. And they would actually use cultural fire to maintain these areas in a huckleberry rich condition. And so this early cereal stage was recognized by Native Americans and they used fire as a tool to either create or maintain some of these open conditions for some of the resources that they viewed as very important, such as black huckleberry. And of course, high bird diversity. Uh, many types of birds need early succession. They benefit from it. They find resources that they need in these conditions. So some good examples include the woodpeckers, like three-toed woodpecker or blackback woodpecker, and they're coming in for the snags and the larvae of a lot of the beetles that find their way into the wood following a major tree killing disturbance. So you'll find these woodpeckers really explode in abundance after a disturbance. Mountain bluebird, which likes all the snags and woody debris, but it also likes to forage in the insect and shrub environment and shrub rich environment of the post disturbance forest. Lazuli bunting is another good example. And raptors, a lot of your broad-winged raptors, like the buteos, red-tailed red hawk and so forth, really like having 
the forest opened up because they're soaring predators. They'll soar, circle, and dive for their prey, which also has increased in abundance in the wake of the disturbance. So voles, uh, deer mice, and so forth will also increase, and they'll support those raptors. American kestrel, uh, red-tailed hawk, Swainson's hawk will visit these disturbed forest sites and hunt there. Flycatchers and kingbirds, they, they like to have some space. They'll, they'll fly out, nab an insect on the wing, and go uh, land on that same perch again. So this is a very common means of hunting for a lot of these birds that like at least large gaps in the forest, if not a much larger disturbed area. And of course, where are the insects coming from? All that early cereal vegetation. And some birds really like this stage. Black-headed grosbeak is a very good example. They like live dominant trees with uh, some shrubs and open foraging areas below. So the males will be able to get up there and sing their hearts out and of course forage effectively in that early cereal rich environment. And some of the birds like broadleaf shrubs or trees, which you could think of things like red alder or willows, which come in in an open sunlight environment, but they're gonna be more prevalent in the early cereal uh, stage. And you'll find birds like spotted tohi that follow the broadleaf vegetation. Grouse, turkey, quail, these all tend to at least use, if not really hang out a lot in the early cereal stage, foraging, breeding. Um, so if you're a blue grouse uh, in North Idaho over here, you like post-fire environments, which is where I took this photo of this blue grouse who's uh, lecking or strutting in hopes of attracting a female blue grouse. So they like the fact that their calls will carry through the open space and they can be seen by a potential mate over space. Now, a lot of organisms that are characteristic of early succession don't just need one thing or the other in a disturbed environment. They're there because there's a conjunction of resources in early succession. The northern hawk owl is a very good example. They need those snags as nesting and perching structures. They like long sight lines so they can see rodent prey from quite a distance away. And they also like the fact that uh, you have a lot of of uh, herbaceous and grassy vegetation that supports a lot of rodents. So everything they need is present in that early cereal phase. And when that early cereal phase uh, converts back over to con closed conifer forest, they tend to leave. So that's what that curve on the upper right here is. That's the observation curve over time um, as the forest ages, the Northern hawk owl tends to not be observed there anymore. So they just move on to other disturbed areas in the landscape. And of course, ungulates, deer, elk, mountain sheep, um, they love to come to large open disturbed areas for the shrubs, the forbs, and the grasses that occur there. And if you have a landscape that really has very little early succession in it, you'll often tend to get declines in the abundance of these culturally and ecologically important animals. So here's a whitetail doe and fawn just over the border here in Idaho using some um, non-forest vegetation early in the spring. And late in the summer, here's, here's some whitetail bucks that are using an open area. So this is actually a, a hay meadow, but it has a lot of the attributes of an early cereal disturbed forest. And a good case in point is the Tillamook burn back in 1931 to 33. The, this is when a large area in Western Oregon burned. And biologists after this burn noticed that black tailed deer density skyrocketed from maybe five or 10 per square mile all the way up to 40, 50 deer per square mile. And this is because they were unable to reforest this uh, rapidly with say Douglas fir. So you didn't have early crown closure and you could get a maturation of the shrub and forb dominated landscape. And that really helped the black tailed deer out because they had more than sufficient food to increase as a herd. Now, an interesting note on disturbance opened areas has to do with our montane ungulates. So mountain goat on the left and bighorn sheep on the right. If you have a large disturbed area, this allows them to travel more safely through uh, and be, be more secure from predation, from predators like mountain lions and so forth that uh, like to use cover for stalking and capturing prey. Also, you have more of the foods that these animals will eat. So if you have disturbances, especially that connect high elevation areas with low elevation areas, you're often facilitating the annual migration of these animals as they have to descend with 
with the snow line in the winter, and then in the summer go back up to their high elevation uh, habitat. So migration corridors are a very important consideration. And throughout the West, we've seen a lot of our migration corridors for this type of organism close over with forest because of things like fire suppression in our Western landscapes. And so managers now are realizing that we need to reconnect low elevation open areas with high elevation open areas for vertically migratory wildlife. And of course, things like lynx. If you have a large disturbed patch of, uh, of post-fire environment up in the northern um, Okanagans and so forth, or the Northeast Cascades, well, that's a future large patch of uh, late serial lynx habitat. Um, but we've also learned that lynx will, uh, especially in the summer, go in and follow snowshoe hares into post-fire environments because the snowshoe hares are following some of that rich early cereal vegetation. So we're learning that lynx, which we once thought were exclusively dependent on old growth closed forest, will actually facultatively use disturbed forest during uh, a different time of year in the summer. So a lot of these organisms, even though we associate them with late cereal, over the course of time, they depend upon large disturbances that create complex forest structures across the landscape. So even these, even though we don't exclusively associate them with disturbed areas, will benefit in the long run from having complex disturbed forest across the landscape. Because often complexity in early succession leads to mid serial and finally late serial complexity often sooner than if you'd gone through a very simple set of forest stages. Butterflies. You, butterflies need uh, nectaring resources and flowers. They need herbaceous vegetation for their larvae. So the larval host, we say, in ecology for these butterflies, um, those plants tend to occur in early succession. And as a result, we see a real abundance and diversity of butterflies in post-disturbance forest because we have their larval plants and their nectaring plants uh, growing in profusion. And even rodents, rodents pick up strongly. A good example that I like to cite is from coastal Oregon. These burned areas that were maintained by homesteaders and grazing later on in time uh, maintained uh, open country rodents like the black pocket gopher. So there's an example of where an unintentional continuation of disturbance on a forest site maintained habitat for a non-forest organism. And of course, the Oregon silver spot butterfly, which is endangered, also hangs out in these very same habitats. Now, one thing that can happen that foresters may not like, but uh, often leads to at least different, if not higher biodiversity, is repeat disturbance. If you have a repetition of a fire within a short period interval, you can often kill even more trees or convert the site more to herbaceous vegetation. And that's gonna benefit a number of organisms in terms of flowers, uh, in terms of animals that really like open conditions like uh, northern alligator lizard or other uh, ectotherms like snakes, lizards. Um, your reptiles are really gonna like these open environments that get very warm. And of course, soaring raptors like it if a repeat disturbance keeps the site open for their soaring hunting activities. And of course, if you have complex early cereal habitats in association with old growth or late cereal habitats, we have a number of organisms that will use both environments uh, throughout their life. Spotted owls down in Southern Oregon and Northern California do this. Vox is swift. They'll go out and feed in the open during the day. This is a, a, a communal bird a colonial bird species. They'll feed in the open and then they'll all fly back in the evening and they'll circle down into a snag to spend the night, to roost for the night. Bats do the exact opposite commute. They'll go uh, into the forest during the day to roost under large bark flakes, but then they'll fly out into the open areas at night and feed in the, in the open habitats, especially over water. And then we have a number of butterflies that also do the same thing. So the point is, is that Disturbed forest is a very important part of our forest landscapes, whether it comes as a result of natural disturbance like fire or windstorm, or even silviculture, forest harvest, if we choose to retain some of the complexity that nature would create with uh, natural methods of disturbance. Skip over this for now. Now, what can we do as non-industrial private forest landowners to create high value early cereal 
early cereal habitats? Well, there's always the traditional harvest, clear-cut harvest, followed by some sort of site preparation. And this is based on an agricultural principle of clearing the site so you can reestablish a desired crop. You know, this does create a brief period of early cereal complexity, and you, you have plants and animals that will certainly use this. And among them are elk. Deer and elk will certainly use this sort of structure before the trees close crown and we enter that stem exclusion phase. The other thing we can do is just create gaps of variable size. Uh, even if you don't have a property that's large enough to do an even age method like clear cutting, you can go ahead and create some gaps of different size and get some different ecological values. Small gaps, you can enrich the understory. Medium sized gaps, a tenth of an acre to a half acre, you might get some shade intolerant tree regeneration and you might get some ungulates and birds and bats using those sorts of gaps. If you go into a mid-sized gap early in the morning and look up, you'll often see a number of bats uh, swirling around, often going one direction as they forage for insects within that gap. So gaps can be an important feature within the forest stand for animals like bats to go and forage in. Now, between a half acre and a couple acres, you'll get a good shrub for grass response at times, and of course, increased wildlife response, especially if you retain some woody debris and some snags within a gap of that size. So something like wild turkey will often come through and use those sorts of gaps. Now, say we clear cut or do some other major uh, gap creation, well, retain some live trees. Uh, leave some dominance that won't just blow over in the wind. So trees with a, a, enough diameter for their height, uh, they'll be a good seed source. They'll give you an opportunity for birds to perch up high, much like our black-headed grosbeak. And maybe leave some smaller intermediate individuals for some hiding cover, some diversity uh, at ground level. And you could also leave them in a regular pattern. Maybe leave some in little leaf islands or aggregates. Maybe leave some scattered. Uh, and maybe you can even keep some of these live trees for multiple harvests of timber so that they grow ever larger and older and contribute to the structural complexity in your property. Now, if you have some defective trees, this is great for things like pileated woodpeckers or hairy woodpeckers shown here, or downy woodpeckers. This is an otherwise perfectly healthy grand fir um, that this pair of uh, hairy woodpeckers has, has nested in. They've excavated and, and a nice little nest cavity. And it's a perfectly healthy grand fir, except that it has some heart rot and an opportunity for these animals to create some uh, roosting structure. So you could look around, maybe find a red cedar that has pileated damage on it. That might be one to retain um, because it's already got defect, which won't lead to good receipts at the mill, but you've got some very good habitat structure in the form of cavities that many other organisms are then going to go in and use. And retain some dead trees. So here's one of those same hairy woodpeckers from the previous slide uh, off on another tree, a dead one this time, and they're foraging on bark beetles and uh, wood-eating uh, beetle larvae. And so, so sometimes dead trees can be the richest element uh, of habitat within your property because you've got all kinds of fungi, bacteria, uh, insects, uh, invertebrates that are utilizing that dead biomass. And that in turn attracts a whole host of other organisms like these woodpeckers. In, in this case, we have a piece of down woody debris on the ground and black bears are foraging on it. So black bears will break in for uh, wood eating termites and, and for other insects that, um, such as yellow jackets that might be in there in pretty good abundance. So woody debris really contributes a lot to the richness of both closed forest environments as well as open forest environments. And here's what it looks like if you retain a number of elements, snags, down wood, a closed island of trees, some scattered trees out there in the harvested area. And so this can lead to some pretty good aesthetics as well as ecological richness. We call this variable retention. So you heard about variable density thinning earlier. This is variable retention where we're variably retaining a number of structures around our harvest unit to create richer habitat. Now you could also leave some areas at low density so that those shrubs and forbs and grasses and so forth will have a place to hang on longer before the crowns close over them. 
And this will lead to greater diversity of vegetation in your landscape. If you have, say, wildlife objectives, or you want to keep your deer, elk, songbird, or pollinator habitat around for longer. So delay your entrance into that stem exclusion or closed forest stage. And also, you might have really harsh microsites in your harvest unit, maybe a rocky area or an area with standing water that's just too wet for tree seedlings to do well. Don't continually replant those. Let those stay open for a while, and that'll help prolong some early cereal values in your stand, even if most of your stand is going to proceed into closed forest again. And you could also plant or permit to establish some broadleaf trees for the richness of their leaf litter, for quick cavity forming. Broadleaf trees often die and rot more quickly, so you get cavity structures in there, um, or just the other habitat values that they offer. Now, fire can also be your friend. So you could use it uh, as a site prep method, and this will bring in new and different species of plant. For example, in this very prescribed fire over here in the clear waters of North Idaho, we had balsam root and helianthella, which are two herbs in the um, sunflower family. And they hadn't been seen on this site in about 60 years, but the very year that my mentor Harold Osborne put fire on the ground, it awakened the seed bank of those species through chemical signaling. They respond to uh, fire produced chemicals that, are, that get into the groundwater and they germinate. And now you have early cereal vegetation from decades ago that simply hasn't been present in the absence of fire. So you could talk to your extension forester about maybe how to incorporate some fire. Even just a pile burn where you burn some slash will provide some different opportunity for plant species that really like a uh, fire created uh, understory environment. And of course, fire will give you nice things like morels in the spring, a lot of ecological value around fire. All right, now one thing you can do if you say you've got a really good tree regeneration response in one of your harvest units, do some early pre-commercial thinning, open it up again, and that'll allow some of that early cereal vegetation to persist. You could also prune. So pruning will improve your wood quality um, in your lower logs of your trees, but it also permits more light to penetrate through the canopy to the understory level. And that also will help you maintain an urban shrub layer in your forest. You could also girdle a few of your retained live trees a decade or two later. You'll let some more light to the understory. You'll also create snag habitat. And finally, you could uh, do some supplemental planting of trees or shrubs just depends upon what you're seeing in your stand and how it's developing. If you didn't get enough trees established, supplemental planting, or if you're seeing that you don't have enough shrubs to provide um, a berry food resource for wildlife, then you could plant some of those as well. So your local plant material center or conservation district can help you get a pretty surprising array of native shrubs for planting in your, uh, your harvest units. Now, an important thing, especially in certain parts of Washington, is to control those invasive shrubs or other plants. So here we've got a bunch of scotch broom over in the Kitsap Peninsula. Scotch broom does really well in the glacial soils of the Kitsap, and so this is a common problem. And of course, you're going to lose a lot of ecological value if you have uh, a monoculture of an, of an aggressive uh, exotic forb or shrub. So this is something to be very aware of. And again, contact your extension agent. All right, so let's take a look at a few examples of created early cereal habitats. So here's an early cereal wildlife opening. This is in Indiana, but this is rich with food for wild turkey, for white-tailed deer and so forth. And you've got a number of trees around it that are still contributing resources like acorns or other hard-mast uh, food resources. So good early cereal wildlife opening. This is an open shelter wood uh, done by the Idaho Department of Lands over here in the Northern Rockies. And you can see that they retained a number of snags. They retained a diversity of tree species, including grand fir, western larch, Douglas fir, and western red cedar. And, but you still have quite a lot of sunlight hitting the ground, and that's gonna enrich the understory with grasses, shrubs, and forbs. Now, this is an interesting project in the Lewis River area. This is where Pacific Corps did some wildlife habitat mitigation because it operates some of the dams in the Lewis River. And uh, 
those dams resulted in the loss of winter habitat for elk. So this really is an elk mitigation project. So they did a bunch of harvesting there and then they are planting at just a low enough density where they're gonna be able to hang on to shrubs and forbs and grasses for quite a long time. And they also placed some downwoody debris in there for structural enrichment. And they bladed the site before they planted it using a tractor to really disturb the soil and make it receptive to some of this early cereal vegetation. Here's a non-industrial private uh, forest uh, ownership here in North Idaho. This is the Osborne property. So Harold and his family have done clear cut, clear cut with retention, open grassland creation. Uh, they've done a silver, uh, a, an ecologically oriented shelter wood where they left a pretty good density of residual trees, including snags. Uh, they've done fuels reduction thinning in their stands that are on warm, dry, south-facing slopes uh, where ponderosa pine is a dominant. And so that reduces overall fire hazard to their landscape. They've also done in, in some of their cedar draws where they've got grand fir, cedar, and larch, they've done group selection and single tree selection where they're just creating small gaps and letting the cedar and grand fir fill back in. So a lot of different silvicultural approaches just on one property. And this is part of what I love about non-industrial private forest landowners is you, you see an awful lot of this on non-industrial non private ownerships because people are free to experiment. Uh, they have a number of objectives besides, uh, besides economic values, just uh, creating timber revenue. So they do a lot of different things for the aesthetics, for the wildlife habitat. So really a fascinating branch of forestry. Now, some of the early logging, of course, they weren't concerned about ecological values or replanting or anything, but really the messy harvesting that they did really left a lot of richness. So often we can look back to some of that unintentionally rich silviculture or forestry or harvesting, I should say, and realize that there were some lessons there for us. So this is a Darius Kinsey photo from 1922. All right, I'm going to conclude with a plea to you all. You know, non-industrial private forest landowners own 360 million acres in this nation, and that's an incredible amount. They're less bound by a number of factors than a lot of other types of forest. And really, you all can help create these diverse early cereal habitats for a lot of different values, bears, birds, butterflies, elk, bats, and financial and ecological viability. And of course, a number of other concerns, inclu including fire resilience, climate resilience, and a lot of other concerns that we have now for our forest landscapes. So thank you all. I'm going to go ahead and stop now with a little bit of time for questions or comments. And again, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. All right. Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate that. That was awesome. Um, we didn't get any questions in the chat box. If you have any um, any questions at all for Mark about the early serial forests or the management implications, um, something specific to your property, even we can take a whack at, um, please feel free to, to type them in. But we did get one question from Samuel. How do you feel about pre-emergence? Okay, so I presume you're talking about pre-emergent herbicides. Is that right, Samuel? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, they absolutely have their place. So basically, a pre-emergent herbicide is uh, what you spray and you're going to try to suppress a sprouting response on the part of shrubs and so forth. Or if you're, if you're talking about plants that are regenerating from seed, you're trying to hit them before they can really dominate the site. So yeah, absolutely, especially if you're trying to alter the composition of that stand. Yeah, pre-emergents absolutely have a role to play. Did that answer the question or? Sounds like it. Um, yeah. So sometimes you'll, you'll have to do a, a pre-emergent application step, go do your planning and then, then maybe hit it again. So this is common, um, this is common on industrial lands. Do I know of any that are wildlife friendly? Um, let me put it this way, I, I don't know very many that are legally labeled and available that are, um, that are dangerous to wildlife. Um, 
you know, you'll of course want to consult with an herbicide specialist or your con local consulting forester uh, to determine the appropriate application rate. So, yeah, I, I don't like to be so vague, but that's a bigger topic than we can probably tackle here. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I have one if no one else is uh, needing the time. When say you were looking to create some early seral habitat by creating a gap or, you know, whatever size, do you recommend, um, you know, putting back in a seed mix or actively planting any shrubs or ground floor? Or are you kind of just of the let, let it grow um, mindset? You know, I think uh, what you could do is just really walk your ground and, and ask yourself what's here, what's, what's established and is going to respond in terms of increased growth rates. You know, a lot of our native shrubs are just going to get released if you cut from above. You cut your, remove the overstory and you're often going to release the understory. So you have to ask, um, is the shrub or forb uh, composition that I have now desirable or will it get released to produce fruits, flowers, that sort of thing? If not, what could I go ahead and plant? And you, like I mentioned earlier, you can obtain an incredible variety of shrubs and even uh, herbaceous plants from your conservation districts. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, all, it's all about your objectives. And we're still learning a lot about how to incorporate planted shrubs into habitat creation um, activities. Yeah, and especially if you're in Western Washington, anytime you open up uh, the canopy, you run the risk of a blackberry uh, patch. So get, yeah. getting ahead of that with planting could be very beneficial, I imagine. And I think that's where herbicides really shine. It allows us to knock down some of these aggressive invasives, you know, that that's an absolute ecological service that, that herbicides can provide. Yeah, definitely. A little bit of herbicide in the short term is a lot better than a, a permanent blackberry patch, basically. <laughs> Okay, well, if there's not any other questions for Mark, um, I just want to thank you again for, for doing this. That was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I think you mentioned if you had uh, other questions um, down the line, um, Mark would be willing to, to take those. So, Absolutely. I'm just going to type my email address into the chat for everyone. Um, there we go. Perfect. And also, here's my direct line. Uh, it's a mobile phone, so feel free to contact me, uh, text, voice, email, happy to answer any questions, and thank you all. I really wish I could stay, but it, uh, we've just uh, started having wild wildland fire ecology and management courses again here, and so I got to go give a lecture for that class. All right, well, good luck. All right, thanks, everyone. Take care. All right, so our next speaker is Connie, Connie Harrington. Uh, are you there, Connie? I'm here. Great, uh, go ahead and share your screen whenever you'd like. I'll, I'll do a brief introduction for you. So many of you probably know the name Connie Harrington, if not know her personally. Um, she's an emeritus scientist with the US Forest Service based in Olympia. Uh, her research is focused on a lot of a pretty wide scope as well, um, and it's focused uh, largely on how forests develop in response to silvicultural practices and uh, stand dynamics in mixed species forests. But she's done quite a bit of work too on um, modeling and researching plant physiology, uh, you know, things like timing of bud burst, flowering, germination, plant growth, and things like that. So. Pretty interesting stuff. Today, she will be discussing um, variable density thinning in older stands, its implications for stand dynamics and uh, uh, management considerations for forest owners that might be considering something like that. So take it away, Connie. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for giving me the opportunity to um, talk about this subject with you. When um, I was first contacted, it was in relation to talking about um, stand dynamics or stand development or something. And I thought, well, that's kind of a broad topic. Could we <laughs> focus it down into something more specific? So um, I offered to talk about variable density thinning and 
kind of uh, compare it to uniform thinning. Um, so I just wanted to mention that this presentation, uh, many people have contributed toward it. And um, we're lucky that Mark's presentation uh, covered a, a broad range of topics, um, including the different stages of stand development. So um, I don't have to feel guilty that I'm not covering some of those aspects. So what I'd like to do today is just um, give you a few definitions about types of thinning and older stands and then information on variable density thinning. Um, we've been working on the Olympic Habitat Development Study for about 20 years, so we've got a lot of uh, data from that. But we've worked on some other projects also, so I have some examples. Most of the information I'm going to provide is on trees, but a little bit on understory. Um, I don't have all the great photos that Mark did, but hopefully you'll um, enjoy seeing, you know, bar graphs and things like that. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, um, thinning is the removal of some trees in a stand to allocate growing space to others. And it can be um, commercial thinning, could be cutting and removing from the stand, or you could be cutting and leaving trees on the ground, or girdling and leaving them standing. Um, any of those could be considered to be part of thinning. And often the biological intent of thinning is to benefit the remaining trees in the stand, uh, but it could be to benefit understory plants or other resources. So in, um, um, in older stands, but really in any age stands, you can come up with a lot of different classifications of thinning. And you've probably heard of a lot of different techniques where people will talk about crown thinning or low thinning, various things. But really, I like to think of thinning as being either uniform or variable. And so uh, traditionally, uniform thinning is the way that most thinnings have been done in a fairly uniform way to give the remaining trees similar amounts of growing space. Not, uh, not exactly equal, but uniform. And this results in the maximum utilization of growing space for trees. And this is contrasted with non-uniform thinning, um, which is often called variable density thinning. And it's designed to increase the growth of trees in portions of the stand, but also to allocate areas for wildlife habitat or biodiversity. So um, I know you all love these textbook reminders, <laughs> but sometimes it gets a little confusing when people are talking about variable density thinning, but they use terminology that kind of implies that they're really talking about uneven age management. And so I just like to remind people that thinning is an intermediate stand treatment. Uh, it's not a silvicultural system or a regeneration method. Um, certainly you may almost certainly will get some regeneration after thinning, but it's not the main objective. Um, on the other hand, depending on where you are in your um, this age of the stand and what you've done so far, the difference in practice between some types of thinning and other types of stand treatments um, may not be great, but um, just wanted to kind of beat this down that, you know, it's an intermediate stand treatment. So just kind of conceptually, if you're doing a uniform thinning, um, it's going to more or less uh, distribute the growing space somewhat equally. It doesn't mean that it's going to be exactly equally. It's not like a pine plantation that you've gone through in a, with mechanized equipment, removing every row or every other row, but, but it, it's fairly uniform. And probably many of you have been involved in thinning, either in young stands or older stands. And you can talk about how you do your thinning or what you want to achieve in a lot of different ways. So it could be the percent of the trees removed, the spacing of remaining trees in the 20 feet, or um, the basal area of the resulting stand. So you can say, 
uh, thin down to 150 square feet per acre. Or you can use other measures such as relative density. Um, usually some kind of thinning specifications are gonna include a mention of the priority tree species to cut um, and or the priority tree species to retain. Variable density thinning. Um, some people have always been somewhat variable in how they, they do their thinning, but the interest has really increased in the past 25 or so years. Um, it, it's a type of thinning that can be applied to an entire unit that's going to be thinning, thinned or in portions of the unit. Um, purposes can be varied. Um, certainly you're going to be or could be removing timber, um, but often the purposes are to benefit wildlife by creating more complex stands, so more stand layers, more understory, uh, more species in general. Often people want to do this because it increases biodiversity, but you can also implement variable density thinning to protect sensitive areas. Um, and some people like it just because of the aesthetics. They really like the appearance of this more variable stand. So um, just kind of a comparison, if you start off with the unthin, with a variable density thinning, you could end up with something like this, where you've got some areas that are, the trees are unthinned, uh, very clumped, and then areas where you've included gaps. So um, one thing that uh, foresters are often saying is, well, what do you want your stand to look like? And, you know, what does it look like now? What species do you have? What's your um, you know, desired condition in the future? And so in this example, these three kind of sketches, you're saying, okay, suppose you start with something like on the right, on the top, then if you um, want it to look more like what's at the bottom, you could say, okay, I want to include some gaps. Um, I maybe want to even create some stand structure in terms of the, the, uh, logs and snags, but I also want to get some understory and, and midstory started. So the three main components that are often talked about in variable density thinning. And as I'll mention a couple of times, you don't have to have all of these components, but, um, but I'll just kind of go over them and then we can talk about some other examples. So um, you can have no cut areas. Some people call them a reserve area. Um, I call them skips as you skip over them when thinning. But the purpose is, um, can be to protect snags, understory plants, or special features. You could have a little bit of a, a, a wet area. You could have some rock outcrops. You could have some things that um, you want to protect. And it doesn't have to be, but often these are also no entry areas for equipment. Um, and from a stand development point of view, in some cases, you're going to have greater suppression mortality in this part of the stand. So it's part of the variation that you will be creating um, in the future. The gaps, creating gaps is part of your variable density thinning. Some people call them openings. You're creating openings in your stand or holes. And although part of the purpose may be to benefit understory plants, um, it also greatly increases tree growth and crown development on the trees, retained trees in a gap, plus the trees on gap edges. And these gaps can be designed to favor tree species that are retained in gaps. So um, I'll show you some examples. Um, and then there's a matrix thinning, which is a general thinning in the rest of the stand. Uh, the general purpose to increase tree growth. And this can be done uniformly or varied to meet objectives. And I mentioned at the beginning that one of the, the 
outcomes of a variable density thinning can be to produce um, uh, volume, timber volume. And the majority of that is going to come probably from your gaps. And certainly the most of the larger trees um, in a variable density thinning come from the gaps. Matrix thinning, often you're thinning from below, and so you're going to be you know, harvesting most of the smaller trees. So um, as I just said, the components of a variable density thinning are not going to be the same in all stands or all areas. Um, one unit might have a uniform thinning, with, but put in a few gaps. Another unit might have uniform thinning with a few skips. Other units might have both skips and gaps, but different numbers and sizes. Um, I actually worked with someone years ago who liked to do variable density thinning by saying, I'm going to thin to a certain spacing until the um, spray can that I'm using to mark the trees uh, is empty, and then when I switch to the next can, I'm going to change my spacing. So it, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve there. So there's no cookbook or right answer. I know often when I go out and uh, look at different projects in the field, people often ask me, what do you think? You know, what, what, how do you think this looks? And I always say, well, what were you trying to achieve? You know, what was the purpose of what you were trying to do? So uh, just what your stand should look like after thinning depends on um, what you want to achieve and, uh, of course, what your starting conditions were. So if you're going to specify a variable density thinning uh, prescription, instead of doing things like um, basal area or mean tree density, you're going to have to uh, talk about the different components of your, your variable density thinning. So for example, you need to specify the number and size of the gaps, what percentage of the area is going to be impacted. And then you'll need to think about, do you want to remove all the trees in the gap or only some? Are you going to leave trees of certain species? Are you going to leave trees of certain size? So you need to think about that in terms of what your gaps are going to do. Then in terms of the skips or these no-cut areas, you need to specify the number and size of the skips. Um, and when I think of part of this is what percent of the area do you want to have in skips? And um, in many cases, the skips are areas in which you're trying to not, uh, not have any impact. So uh, you want to protect snags, you want to protect this uh, wet area, a seep, you may want to protect some particular plants. And so you may not want to allow any equipment traffic in those areas. Um, in other cases, uh, allowing some minor equipment traffic would be, would be reasonable. So, but that's something to think about when you're designing a prescription. The other thing is um, you're still going to have the matrix in addition to the skips and gaps. So you can specify these, what you do in this matrix, the same way you would the uniform thinning, that is tree spacing, basal area, relative density, or you can implement it in a more complex fashion, uh, depending on species diversity and objectives. And I've seen some prescriptions for thinning in the matrix that were so complex that I would have trouble implementing them myself, <laughs> um, much less trying to write it into a contract um, or explaining to the um, uh, forester or, or the uh, logger what you wanted to achieve. So uh, there may be reasons to go for something complex, but it doesn't have to be. It can be a, a fairly simple thing. So just this example again, where we have these no cut areas of the skips in the corners of this particular example. And in this case, we had some large snags that we were protecting. Um, so it, in some of our stands, we're protecting snags. In other cases, there might be some large stumps. 
or some areas of um, large woody debris. And you might say, well, what's the benefit of a large stump? But stumps and large down material <coughs> can be very important for wildlife. And for example, in some cases, you can have um, maternal dens being underneath a large, uh, a large stump. Or you can have areas where uh, a lot of wildlife is using the area for, uh, for denning. So then gaps, I think everyone has a pretty good idea of what a gap is. In this case, it looks like uh, the gaps have a lot of uh, freckles in them. And this was indicating that they were smaller trees. And when people are uh, specifying what's to be done in the gaps, they're usually ignoring the smaller trees because it's very difficult to, to say what's going to happen to those smaller trees. But often those are not included as part of your prescription. You're just talking about the trees that are going to be of merchantable size. So in terms of creating gaps, you can start from scratch um, or you can expand um, an existing gap. So there could already be a gap and you just want to make it a little bit larger. And then, um, then there'll be these other areas that will still need a prescription. What are you going to do with what's not in the skip or the gap? So um, some of the examples I'm going to give you are from the Olympic Habitat Development Study. It was started with a congressional earmark in the budget 1994 to establish old growth demonstration areas. And the, but the purpose of the study was to show how we might be able to accelerate the development of stand structures and plant and animal communities associated with late successional or old growth forests. In addition, we've done some work with Washington State Parks, um, two parks, Sequest and Nisqually State Parks. They had areas with unthinned plantations and they were interested in working with us to develop variable density thinning prescriptions. They wanted to make the stands more variable. Um, this would make them more attractive to maybe both short-term and long-term park visitors, improve wildlife habitat, improve long-term forest health, and also provide some opportunities for education. So, um, you know, Mark mentioned this before and I mentioned it and we'll say it again. <laughs> You need to think about what you want to achieve by thinning. You know, what do you have? Um, what do you want to achieve in the short term? What do you want to achieve in the long term? What are the current conditions in terms of species, density, understory, access? Uh, what's feasible in terms of design, layout, and implementation? What kind of resources do you have available? So sometimes people say, well, I'd like to, you know, have things be more variable, but maybe I should just wait. Do we want to wait to see that things become more variable or do we want to take action? So if we're interested in making things more like older stands, um, what are those characteristics that we might be trying to achieve? So um, we'd like to have larger trees. So, you know, we have kind of guidelines that have been developed for different um, plant associations or different types, forest types. So in this case, we'd want to have um, you know, at least eight trees per acre greater than 32 inches in diameter. Um, but in addition, we want to have some shade tolerant tree species. Um, more of them, but they're going to be much smaller in diameter. We'd like to have develop um, a deep multi-layered canopy. We'd like to have some conifer snags um, and also logs. And I underlined some of these um, goals in yellow because those are what um, in some of the graphs I'm going to show you, those are those areas are marked. 
So the Olympic Habitat Development Study has eight sites on the Olympic National Forest and the Olympic Peninsula and Western Washington. And these were um, 40 to 70 year old conifer stands, uh, mostly in that stem exclusion stage that Mark talked about. Major species, Douglas fir, hemlock, spruce, but we had many other species there. Most of them were naturally seeded. Some blocks had been commercially thinned in the past. And, uh, but they all had what I would consider to be quite simple stand structures, mostly just overstory trees, not much in the understory. So the purpose of our treatments in this particular study, we wanted to accelerate development of these stand structures uh, that would be in older stands. And the idea is that if we made a more variable light environment via our thinning, this would increase variability in tree growth and stand structure and in understory vegetation. Um, on the other hand, skips would preserve snags and species sensitive to disturbance, but we also wanted to do some coarse woody debris enhancement. And when we first started thinking about this study, we were walking through some of the stands and um, I was admiring some of the snags and one of the foresters said, well, those snags would all be cut for worker safety. And I was like, no, no, we can't do that. That would be not consistent with what we're trying to do. And so that was kind of the beginning of thinking about, you know, why we need to have skips as part of the stands. Sometimes people say, well, you know, we can just have skips in our riparian areas. And it's like, well, if you have a lot of riparian areas, that might be um, a reasonable thing to achieve. But in other cases, if we really want to preserve the snags, we need to think about, well, how can we do that and still uh, keep things safe for the loggers? So how did we lay out their skips and gaps? Um, and I always emphasize we, because sometimes I think when I talk about a research study, people think that, you know, this is the way that I'm saying you should do it, but, um, but that's not necessarily so. So in this case, we did 10% of the area in skips. They were kind of a quarter to three quarter of an acre. We were protecting these large snags or other features. And we wanted to keep skips, at least a chain away from gaps, <clears throat> with the idea that um, if the gaps are close to the skips, then it makes the skips less effective in protecting, say, uh, certain plants or certain things it would be more influenced by the gaps. <clears throat> the gaps, we did them 15% of the area. So they were about a tenth of an acre, um, slightly larger if we were expanding a previous opening. We didn't want any preference species cut in gaps. Uh, so in most cases, we would not want to cut hardwoods. We would not want to cut, say, red cedar or true fir. I mean, it just depends on what species that you have that you're working with. <clears throat> And then the thin mat matrix was 75% of the stand. In this case, we did a light thinning from below. <clears throat> so this is an example of the layout of the skips and gaps we had <clears throat> um, in one of our stands. This is a 22 acre stand. And the black dots were large snags. Um, the little squares like these were little hardwood snags. Um, the little gray areas were existing openings. These yellow areas were new gaps that we were going to be creating. Each square um, is about 33 by 33 feet, so the gaps were about one chain by one chain. And when I was talking about the percentage of the area that was in skips and gaps, and then 75% was in um, the matrix. It may have seemed like the percentage of areas in skips and gaps was small, but in fact, the skips and gaps all have um, edge effects. And so, as I mentioned, we don't want to have the gaps too close to the skips because then it makes it so that the, the skips are not as dense. Um, 
but there's nothing magical about the percentages that we used. But I do encourage you, if you're trying to lay out something, to actually try and do it on paper and, and try moving things around uh, before you just put some numbers down. So as I've said a couple of times, there's no right answer. It really depends on your started conditions and objectives. If your stand has a high height diameter ratio, um, so tall, skinny trees, it will be predisposed to wind throw if you put in large gaps. And so we wanted to keep the gaps small, um, less than the height of the dominant trees. So we, we did them one chain, our trees were taller than that. So it was keeping the wind throw pretty low in the future. They're gonna be any size. In our case, we just happened to have a grid already laid out for research purposes. So it was easy to do things square, but they could be rectangular, circular, irregular. And I'll show you another example. And as I said before, in your gap, you can remove all the merchantable or cut all the merchantable trees, or you can base cutting based on species and size. Um, or you can center a gap on one or more trees, and we've done that several times. So this is an example of a figure that's in a, a report we put out uh, recently, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, but these were just some different ways that gaps have been laid out. So um, if you look at the ones in the circles, you could um, flag a tree in the center in a certain way that you want it retained. And then you want everything around that tree to be removed for some distance. And that really makes it um, so that that tree is going to have you know, really good crown development. And as Mark said, you're, you know, could have some mini uh, kind of development of, of uh, more early cereal species in some cases. Or you can mark the center tree for removal um, in, in this case. Or you could do something in a more irregular fashion. You can mark the trees along the edge that are either going to be retained or those are going to be removed. Or you can make kind of a long, skinny, irregular gap in which you mark the trees for removal, and then you say everything within a certain distance of that tree gets removed. So it's giving you a, you know, a long skinny gap or an irregular gap. So um, <laughs> just want to make sure that everyone realizes that they're not saying that gaps should be square or gaps should be round or, you know, they can be whatever seems to work for your objectives. Um, so these were two examples from working with Washington State Parks. In this case, um, this was a big leaf maple, I believe, and uh, we flagged the tree in a certain way to say, okay, we wanted to retain that tree and everything within a certain distance of that tree would be cut. In another case, uh, we could mark a tree, in this case it was painted, to say this was the center of a gap that was going to be a 30-foot radius. And that center tree, as well as um, everything within 30 feet, would be cut. And in this case, in terms of uh, uh, logging uh, compliance, we also painted the base of the tree so we knew what had been done. So when I've worked on projects with the Forest Service and with some landowners, everything ends up getting painted. And this can be good, especially if it's going to take a long time to go from planning to, to completion. But when I worked with Washington State Parks, they were confident that things could happen pretty quickly. And so, um, and they were also concerned because it was in a park that they wanted it to be attractive in the future. So we used paper flashers that we stapled on. And we used the flashers both in some cases on the edge of skips. Um, but we could also use them in gaps. So um, in terms of laying out the skips, you can say, oh, I want to protect snags. I want to do this. I want to do that. Um, but you also need to consider what your logging system is. So um, if you're going to have a, a cable system, uh, you may need to lay out your skips at the edge of the units. So you're not trying to get harvest trees that are 
beyond your skips. Um, and you may want them to be kind of somewhat rectangular, long and narrow, if you want to be able to efficiently cable yard on each side of your, um, of your skip. Ground-based systems are simpler, but you also need to think about if uh, how much turning of equipment there would be depending on where you're going to put your skips in your, uh, uh, in your gaps. And as I mentioned before, the majority of your volume is going to be coming um, out of your uh, gaps. And so you're going to have skid trails that are going to go kind of from gap to gap. So you need to think about, okay, if I'm going from gap to gap, um, where could I put my skips? And they, as I say, they wouldn't have to be, you know, a square or rectangular, but you just, you do need to think about how they would fit in with your gaps and how they would fit in with your overall system. So I mentioned that we have a report um, that we developed recently. Uh, Leslie Brody is a forester that's worked with me on that goes over a lot of these things that I've just been covering. And I'm going to bring some copies of this on the field trip tomorrow. Um, I think I have 20 copies with me. So, um, and I think there's 50 people <laughs> registered for the field trip. Um, but if you uh, don't have a chance to pick one up on the field trip or you're not coming on the field trip, uh, feel free to email me and I'll see that um, we get a copy out to you. But these are all, this is available online. Uh, but if you like to have things in hard copy, we do have hard copies available. So I'm going to talk about some results from our project. Um, first, implementation issues. And really, the most important thing is just to make sure you have good communication with uh, your consultants, whether it's uh, extension foresters or whether it's uh, contractors. Um, uh, and with the loggers. They need to understand what you're trying to achieve. Um, I think a lot of times people can do a you know, fantastic job if they know what you're trying to achieve, but uh, if you don't explain it well, then often it's like, well, I, I didn't know that that was important. So just communication is important. Stand damage, I mentioned wind throw. Um, we haven't had much problem with wind throw in our stands, but we have, as I said, tried to keep keep the gap small. Um, logging damage, you know, I think it's um, in some cases you will need to probably be flexible if some trees have been damaged. You need to decide if you want to retain them for future snags um, or if you want to trade trees so that you know, this tree that's quite damaged gets cut and the tree that was going to be cut maybe uh, is retained. So I'm going to show you a couple examples about tree growth and understory development. And these examples uh, mostly use metric units, but I um, would just like you to try and focus on the relative numbers in the things and not the specific units that are being shown. So um, we first started talking about working in these older stands. Several people said, well, older stands don't really respond to thinning. And so just wanted to show in this, just this five years after thinning, we could see that the unthinned areas did not grow as well as the thinned trees did. And as I mentioned before, we end up with a lot of edge effects. That's part of what we want in variable density thinning. Um, we want to create a lot of edges because that was what would happen in natural stands. And so if you look here in the middle, you got the best growth if you were close to a gap. This is within 30 some feet of a gap. Um, and uh, the next best is if you're close to a skid trail. Uh, so this was just the first five years and these relationships continued uh, going forward over time. There's a lot of differences. Um, on the other hand, if you're, um, uh, if you're close to an unthinned edge or close to a skip, then your trees are going to be growing more poorly than if they're further away from those skips. So lots of edges. And um, we've uh, published some of these things recently about 
structural responses 14 years after treatment and recruitment and development of shade tolerant conifers after 17 years. So we have some recent publications out and there are links at the end of the file, but also I'll tell you how to find them. So uh, crown length, um, crown length changes with edges. And so we have all these different categories. And the only thing you need to remember looking at the graph is the ones where we have the greatest change in crown length here on the left are those that have the most space. So these are along gaps. And these are in the matrix a little further and then going out you know, into these um, skips. So, you know, how, do, how does crown length change? Well, it can change in three ways. Um, one is you can develop epicormic branches. Depends on the species. Some species like spruce, some of our hardwoods um, are pretty prone to developing epicormic branches. Duck fir can, but it's much less common. Um, so what is really important to get crown length to change is um, height. So as the trees are growing in height, if there's no change at the bottom, then the crown length is going to increase. On the other hand, if the lower branches start dying back, then it's going to decrease from the bottom. And then the question is, is it increasing in height more than it's decreasing at the bottom? So, um, so here we can see these are changes in crown length for trees of different sizes. These are the smallest ones. So some of these smaller trees, we can get an increase uh, in crown length um, and also uh, an increase in, uh, in diameter. But what's uh, really important is what species do you have? So the shade tolerant species, the hemlock, the spruce, true firs, really retain lower branches better than the spur, which is more shade intolerant. So in this example over here, um, even within the thinned matrix, the Douglas fir is losing crown length. Um, but the, in this case, the Sitka spruce and the Western hemlock are increasing in crown length. So if you want those longer crown lengths, um, you need to be thinning, but you need to think about what species you can favor. And this is especially important around gaps. Um, some foresters, when we first started this study, said, well, we can just thin to a wider density, lower density, wider spacing. Um, but then they realized, you know, that there really is value in those gaps, in especially what it does for crowns. So I want to show you a little bit about some diameter distributions. Um, so this is one stand up on the peninsula on your forks. Uh, many of you see, have seen this is just number of trees by these diameter classes. Um, kind of a normal shaped distribution. Um, this was a study that a stand that was unthinned prior to thinning. And then this is what it looked like 14 years after thinning. So it's gotten a little flatter in the distribution, it's spread out a little bit more in the upper end, but we've gotten this big slug of trees down here in the smaller size classes. So just looking at it in a little bit different way, if we, uh, this top line here was the stand prior to treatment, and then this next line down is the stand just after treatment. So basically, um, the difference between these two lines is what we cut. So we, we cut the trees in here. Um, on the other hand, this big difference between this, these two lines over here um, is the effect of the logging equipment. And so I remember um, one of the timber sale administrators who said, you know, anything less than six or eight inches is like air to the logger. So, so unless it's going to be in a skip or it's protected in some way, um, a, a large number of the smaller trees um, in your gaps and in some of the thinned areas um, are going to uh, be destroyed in your thinning. On the other hand, in this case, this was uh, 14 years later, 
you can see that we've developed a lot of trees in those smaller size classes, so that wasn't a concern. So uh, we can look at changes in diameter distributions over time, and I think it's interesting in this skip, so the unthinned area between these two lines here, um, we had quite a bit of uh, mortality um, in these some size classes. And on the other hand, the thinned matrix, um, there was some mortality in these smaller trees, but the big change is shifting the whole diameter distri distribution to the right. So as the trees are growing, we're still having a distribution of diameter uh, classes, but it's been shifted to the right. And just a, a second example, another stand. This was one that actually had been previously um, thin. And um, so there was a larger number of small trees. But when we uh, commercially thinned it, we got another second batch of small trees coming in. And just again, looking at these changes in diameter distributions, we can see that in these smaller, it's kind of the mid portion of the diameter distribution in the skip is where we had the majority of the mortality and not much mortality um, in the larger size classes. And in fact, on this particular stand, the maximum tree size is about the same in the skip and the thinned. Um, but in the thinned, we've had a, a good shift to the right. And so in these larger sizes here, um, these Uh, we've really increased how many more trees there are going to be in these larger diameter size classes as compared to how many there um, would be in this, this skip area. And we've looked a little bit at this, the uh, medium sized trees again. This is just another example, even very early on in Western Hemlock that was in the mid story is responding to the thinning and the response increases over time. So as I mentioned, um, thinning is an intermediate stand treatment and it's not designed specifically to give you regeneration, but whether you want it or not after a thinning, you're almost always going to get some, but the amount of regeneration and the species and how it develops um, will really vary over time. So just this one example, it came from uh, several different stands and we have uh, different time periods since thinning. So three, seven, 10, 17 years. And then these different colored bars at each age are going from uh, the green or gap, the one furthest to the left in each group, and then the thinning, um, and then the skip, and then this is another type of control. Which... So sometimes people look at this and they'll say, huh, how come the gap? How come the trees in the gap didn't do the best? Well, what happened was these were seedlings and these are saplings. So um, the trees in the gaps grew out of the seedling size class into the sapling size class. So they're greater than dBH. And so now you can see at year seven, we have a big increase in the number in the gap compared to just the thinned area or in the skips. So, um, so even though it's a, uh, oops, excuse me. Um, so even though Western hemlock is a shade tolerant species, it still is going to have different growth rates um, in the different portions of the stand. So that was Western hemlock. In this case, this is Sitka spruce. Sitka spruce is much less shade tolerant than Western hemlock. And so um, the seedlings really did much better in the gaps, uh, particularly early on, as opposed to in the hemlock where we were seeing them moving out of that seedling category quickly. So um, sometimes we think about, we, all, we have all these seedlings and we have these saplings. In this case, we were talking about um, those that were saplings to begin with. So um, these were diameter growth. Oh, 
excuse me, um, diameter growth of ones that um, had already crossed breast height at the time of the thinning. And so they grew very well in the gap at the beginning, um, but then the growth rate started going down uh, quite quickly. And so the gaps are great initial environments, but there's increasing competition for with all the other seedlings and saplings in the gap, as well as the shrubs, um, and herbaceous material. In addition, the trees, the large trees that are on the side of the gaps are continuing to grow in height. Their branches are continuing to grow in from the sides and their roots are um, expanding into the gaps also. So the gaps are you know, pretty nice environments the first few years, but then they become less desirable. So, um, uh, but the trees in the gaps, this advanced regeneration, they, they uh, a certain percentage of them will grow well. Uh, so we do have some mortality in the, um, uh, of the advanced regeneration, and it's mostly in the smallest uh, size classes. But again, often people are surprised that there's more mortality, percent mortality in the gap than in the thinned or the skip. And it's just a question of, um, it's, it could be quite a ferocious environment in those gaps where there's so much development, so, so much vegetation. So uh, tree response to variable density thinning, trees responded in variable ways. Diameter growth increased, especially in the gaps. Crown length increased, especially in the gaps. Um, and the shade tolerant species moved from seedlings to saplings and from saplings into the midstory. Shade tolerant species benefited the most. Uh, some other things, I'm gonna quickly hit a couple other topics. Can you create structure? I know probably many of you have been involved or thought about creating snags, um, but you can also create coarse woody debris on the ground. We created these log pyramids or piles, and they were, um, they were uh, colonized by other species uh, fairly quickly. Understory development, um, openings in the canopy, particularly these gaps, can really impact the plants that are present. Um, initial conditions, uh, what species were present, what the density was really influence early results. And the results differ across sites. So I'm just gonna show you a couple quick examples. This is one I like. It's showing the percent of plots at different times a control and variable density thin areas. So we start here, year three, and it's like 60, 70% of the plots um, were in this 10% cover of the plants, of the herbaceous plants. And it increased at year seven, and this is because there was an ice storm. So there were some branches that broke and some tops that got knocked out. But, but still, it's, it's tending toward these lower, even by year 10. On the other hand, if, when we did the variable density thinning, you could see that we really increased the variation. When we put plots in all across our unit, some of them are still down in the, kind of like the skips, like the control or unthin. Some of them are intermediate, and some of them have, have become, have very high cover. Um, but on the other hand, it depends on what we started with. So in this case for shrubs, Snow White, there was very little, oh my green's gotten so sensitive. It's gotten very, um, very little difference between the control and variable density thin at the beginning and very little change over time between the treatments. On the other hand, if there was very little to begin with, like at the bait area, um, then the variable density thinning was really effective. Um, but there's a lot of variation with species and with time. So bracken fern jumped up quite a bit in both the gaps and the thinned areas. Other species may have had a smaller response. Um, this is one where we're looking at percent cover close to a gap, further away, um, adjacent to the gap, in the gap. And um, some, for example, the understory species, the understory trees, they increased quite a bit but the shrubs didn't increase much in this example. 
you might say, well, why didn't the shrubs increase? And that's because there was a lot of browsing in the gaps. So uh, a lot of browsing in this unit in particular, but the gaps were particularly heavily hit. So the species is important. You know, you need to think about what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to favor shrubs, so you're trying to favor herbaceous species. Um, you know, it's important that they be native species. We have a new manuscript in progress. Um, hopefully it'll come out very shortly. It's been reviewed by a journal. Um, but basically, we saw variable density thinning did not result in lasting increase in non-native plants. Um, we've all seen lots of non-native plants along the edges of roads and you know, major landings, but within our main stand, we, we didn't see that. So, uh, for example, here we did get a big increase. Uh, this is year seven uh, on a few of our plots. But by the time we got out here to year 15 or 17, um, there was no significant difference between the thinned areas and the unthinned areas and um, cover of non-native plants. So um, older stands respond to thinning. Variable density thinning can increase tree variability. Plant communities are becoming more variable. Um, non-native plants with the type of variable density thinning we did has not been a problem. Just a couple quick final thoughts. Older stand models such as FES didn't include variable treatments, but some have been updated with recent data. So um, um, FES, the forest stand simulator was refit in 2013, does a much better job in predicting the growth of small trees. Uh, this particular model um, grow small trees and larger trees separately and the large tree model was doing fine but the small tree model wasn't working well. Um, we have a website that's in this kind of newer format. Um, includes information on the Olympic Habitat Development Study and includes several recent publications, links to those publications. We have an older website. Um, I'll give you the link at the end. Um, that is much more dense <laughs> Lots of additional information, uh, many different parts to it. Um, uh, it's not, has not been converted to the new version. So if you're really interested in some of the details, this might be one for you to look at. It includes some virtual trails, a management tour, tree tour, understory tour, natural history. Also includes a laugh and learn, um, trying to uh, use humor to, to explain why different things happen or don't happen. Um, uh, I think I'll stop there and open it up for questions. This is the um, uh, a website for this, this older model or this older website, uh, but you can email me and I can always send that along. And um, I do want to just mention that for publications, all the publications can be found at something called Tree Search. And um, if you go to Tree Search and you put in the author last name and the date range, so you you just remember my last name and maybe, oh, it was something after 2015 or after 2018 or something, you'll come up with a list and then you can download those particular publications. So we've had quite a few publications on the project, so those might be helpful to you. Um, okay, I'll open it up for questions. Great, thanks, Connie. Um, it did look like you got one question here, uh, or a request more appropriately. Um, please discuss in a couple sentences, again, whether uh, shade tolerant or shade intolerant trees do the best with variable density thinning and why? Okay, so um, yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, you have the greatest opportunity to uh, change stand development if you have a mix of shade tolerant and shade intolerant species. So if you're trying to grow things into the mid-story um, or uh, get things developed long-term in your small gaps, 
you really need some shade tolerant species. On the other hand, you can do what you want with less shade tolerant species if you can increase the size of the gaps. So it depends on you know, what you have to work with and uh, uh, where you're starting. You wouldn't want to go into a very dense shade intolerant stand and put in large gaps. Um, on the other hand, you might be able to plant some shade tolerant species. So you know, depending on what you start with, you may be able to do some things, but not do other things as effectively. Hopefully that in a couple sentences gives you an idea of how, how it might work. Great. Uh, yeah, if there's any other questions for Connie, feel free to type them in. Uh, oh, we got one from Bob here. Uh, do you have an idea of how much time and cost it takes to prepare a VDT or variable density thinning versus uniform thinning? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> it really depends on a lot of different factors. And I know when we first started working with the Forest Service, there was um, some lack of enthusiasm for variable density thinning because of the requirements um, um, for determining what the volume was going to be removed in the stand because it's more complex since you've created a more variable situation. So it really depends on how important it is to understand the specifics of what the volume removal is going to be. If you can keep it fairly broad in terms of you know, being happy to say, well, it's just going to be this percent here and this percent there. Um, on the other hand, if you really need to cruise your stand to come up with you know, careful estimates of what the volume is that's going to be removed, it's going to increase that cost. A lot of it is um, depending on you know, what your restrictions are, but also um, you know, how comfortable you are. Are you going to go out and do things multiple times? So for example, once you get comfortable, and it talks a little bit about this in that guide to variable density thinning, if you have a good idea of what you want to do, you can often go through the stand quickly to see what the, the areas are that you might want to favor. And then you can go back through with a GPS and your flagging or your paint or your markers and start doing it, um, marking things as you go. So you don't have to go through your stand multiple times doing a detailed inventory and then laying out what you're going to favor and what you're not going to favor. So if you've never done it before, um, it's definitely going to be more time consuming. Um, but there's lots of little things that you can learn as you go uh, through the process that will make it more and more efficient as you, you know, continue to use the, the technique. Great, uh, and I might have missed it, but are there any opportunities or w would there be any opportunities to tour the Olympic habitat study in person or is it pretty closed off to the public? Um, there, there would be opportunities, but I was actually thinking about this recently. Um, it might be simpler, uh, better access to uh, view some of the state parks. Mm it may be easier for people to get to some of these areas. Um, one of them's up kind of uh, foothills of Mount Rainier, uh, others down kind of near Woodland. But, but anyway, um, yeah, we can talk about potentially doing some tours, you know, maybe next year or something. Um, but yeah, it's certainly possible to get out to the Olympic Peninsula. Um, but for some people, it would be a lot easier, you know, make it a, a simpler day trip to be able to go to one or two of the parks to see what we've done. Yeah, maybe we should work together to set that up. That would be really yeah. cool. Yeah. And, and I, I know I've thrown a lot of information at people pretty quickly. And I'll just mention that I'll, I'll be at the field trip uh, tomorrow morning, not in the afternoon. Um, and I, I'm planning to wear a blue jacket. So if you've got a vague idea of what I look like, and you can look for me in the blue jacket if you've got some follow-up questions. And, and you can email me, of course. That's great. Um, yeah, well, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, thanks again for, for coming and, and, well, coming. But thanks for, for 
phoning in and doing this webinar. I really appreciate your expertise and looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, looks like Nick put in a link to a survey uh, for this. I really appreciate your guys' input. If you can just take a few minutes um, to, to fill that out, let us know what you thought of the webinar. Um, Nick, Bob, do you have any closing comments? Absolutely wonderful, Connie. Um, lots of great information. Uh, love the fact that you have this well documented. Um, that, that was one of my questions for Mark is, how are we going to be able to share this knowledge and this, uh, this experience? Because we've got new folks coming online and uh, there's lots of people. I know lots of tree farmers who would love to share their experiences. They're probably doing some or, or, uh, or thinking about it. So uh, it's great that you put together that template. And again, just thank you for, for everything for this presentation. And, and um, I, I echo that remark. And um, I mean, I've done a lot of variable density thinning. And that's one thing that I know is to be clear on what your objectives are and what you're trying to do is really key. And then also um, what, what the sideboards are, because that will affect how much time or whatever it takes to actually implement one. So. But great job. Thank you.